All right. Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar on theater and archiving with the American Theater Archive Project. My thanks to Doug Newell for his help getting this webinar organized and to Jenny Curtin for helping on the back end this morning. I also want to thank the Harry Ransom Center for hosting this webinar on behalf of ATAP and the American Society for Theater Research and its members for their continued support of our work. Finally, many thanks to all of you for coming to today. My name is Eric Clary, and I'm the Curator for Theater and Performing Arts Collections at the Harry Ransom Center, an archive library and museum at the University of Texas at Austin. I started my career as a professional theater director, a stage manager, and a sound designer. And I've been working in museums and libraries in some capacity for, for over 20 years now. I hold a PhD in theater historiography with a minor in museum studies from the University of Minnesota. And I've been with the American Theater Archive Project now since about 2015. So I think for many people, the idea of archives can be shrouded in mystery. And you might have visions of something like the end of Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark. There's these cavernous storage facilities filled with boxes where things are put away and, and sometimes forgotten. Or sometimes the idea of trying to wrap your hands and your mind around many years worth of records is just incredibly overwhelming and, and folks don't know where to begin. But that's why the American Theater Archive Project exists. We're a network of archivists, dramaturgs, artists, and scholars who are passionate about preserving the legacy of American theater. And we've been around since 2009 as, a, uh, as an initiative of the American Society for Theater Research. So uh, I'm going to share my screen here and uh, we'll get started. So yes, the mission is that uh, we support theater makers and archiving records of their work for the benefit of artists, scholars, patrons, and the public. And most importantly, for the creators, uh, the people, all of you who are making your own records. And joining us today here uh, in this webinar, I know are a lot of theater artists and representatives of theater companies from across the country. Welcome. Uh, I know many of you are at different stages. Some of you have uh, are just beginning to think about archiving your work. Some of you have been uh, working on uh, collecting your archives for many years now. And so uh, hopefully there'll be information here that's useful to you. And we're always around as a resource in addition to this webinar. If at any point you have any questions too, I wanna to invite you to use the Q&A feature uh, in the, the Zoom uh, recording here. Uh, we, I'll answer questions uh, throughout the program and then also leave time at the end. And really there's no question that's too basic, too simple, too outrageous. Uh, it can be specific to what you're doing right now. Really, I want to encourage you to, uh, to, to ask questions. This is a really great opportunity to be able to connect with you. Uh, so please, please do. Uh, there's a question I see about, uh, about access to the recording after. Yes, we are recording this webinar and we will be putting it up on the, uh, the ATAP website. Uh, so please do uh, sign up on our, our website for our newsletter. Uh, you'll find out more information, not only about this recording, but for future events. So the plan for today is to sort of go over some of the basics of how to get started with archiving, why you might keep it, uh, why, uh, how, how you can talk to colleagues about it, especially if you work for a theater company, to get them involved. Uh, where do you go to to find things like funding? Um, how do you use it? How do you make it accessible? And how do you think about it in terms of the future? And then also what kinds of resources does the American Theater Archive Project offer to be able to support you throughout the process? So that's the plan. Uh, so why keep an archive? Top 10 reasons. Uh, there's lots of reasons beyond these 10, but here's a good top 10. They will actually save you time and money through the organization of your records. If you're able to keep things organized, you'll know exactly where to go to to find material when you need it. If you are in the habit, for example, of applying, applying for grants to be able to go back through previous grant applications will allow you to be able to see what, uh, what you did before, uh, to be able to also um, build off of, few, of past work. You can establish and make visible the historical connections within your community. So if you are a theater company, for example, that's been around for years, uh, being able to share that history and its embeddedness within the community means that you will be able to connect even more deeply with your audiences and with your donors. You can uncover and preserve historical gems among, hidden among your stuff. This is always amazing. Uh, I love hearing from folks who are digging through their collections, uh, whether they're personal collections or uh, through the connect collections of 
organizations, theater companies, and just randomly coming across some of the most incredible things that they didn't know that they'd saved uh, or that their company ha had held on to. Um, you can improve interdepartmental communications, especially within theater companies that have a tendency to be siloed by administrative staff, artistic staff, uh, contractors that come in and do, uh, you know, design work maybe just for one production. There's the education department, marketing and box office sometimes has their own sort of separate wing education. So really being able to, to pull the archive together is a way of being able to make those bridges across different departments. You can relieve staff of the burden of institutional memory. And this is also really big too, especially with so much turnover happening uh, within the theater community these days. There's so much rich information and history within the community. Uh, it, you know, we have a tendency to say, oh, so-and-so knows what happened. We can always just go to them. But uh, there's always a time when, when you're not going to be able to go back to that person and ask them questions. And so being able to have an archive to go to will be enormously helpful. The work of archives, there's, there, there is a labor involved in creating and maintaining archives, but it's a wonderful way of engaging students, veteran volunteers and retired staff, donors, um, a whole bunch of, of different stakeholders. Uh, you can engage them within the work of, the, of creating and maintaining the archive. You can also free up space. Uh, and this is, this is <laughs> there's, we'll talk about this in a moment, but there's a difference between records and archives and some things that you maybe want to save and some things that you really don't need to save. And there's a difference between the two. And we'll talk about that here in a moment. You can collaborate with local and national education and cultural institutions, attract legacy specific grant money, and secure your company's place in history. One of the main reasons why ATAP was started in 2009 was a recognition that, uh, that if theater scholars and artists were wanting to look back at theater history within America, there needed to be archives to be able to do that. And if theater companies weren't preserving this material, if artists weren't saving this material, then the record itself would be uh, would not be there to be able to understand what happened. So being able to create and maintain an archive is a way of maintaining your voice and your work within the historical record. And there's a lot of people in invested in this. So if you can think about uh, anybody really involved in your organization or your own personal work, they can all be stakeholders in the archive. They can all find ways of using it. Journalists, for example, will use it uh, to, to understand the context of your work uh, over time. Patrons and donors love archives because it gives them a sense of, of how their, their impact is, uh, is growing over time uh, and the longevity of, of the investment that they're making. Scholars and students, of course, will be able to do research into it. Artists use archives too when they, they work um, to be able to get inspired by, by uh, the organization's mission and the work that they've created before. And for executives and board members and staff, especially like I said, with, with different uh, levels of turnover, you know, this is an incredible opportunity to be able to understand where an organization's been or where an artist has been and where they're going into the future. So before you even get started, some questions you might wanna ask yourself. What, uh, what do you want to share about your theater or your work and its history? What records are essential for telling that story and who will your archive serve? These are really great questions just because once you actually start digging through the records, if you have answers to these questions, it will help guide you. It will help, uh, it'll help you be able to make determinations of what to save, what not to save, to be able to look at what you have collected and see if there's anything missing. Uh, and then you can actively collect around that. So how to begin? We'll talk through each of these different steps uh, but the first step is really thinking about assessments and really looking and uh, seeing what you have uh, at the beginning. As I mentioned before, there's a difference between records and archives. All of your records are not necessarily your archives. There's, there's just a portion of what you are creating that might be considered your archive. It may not all be valuable uh, or important to keep uh, for, for historical records but you ultimately are the one who gets to decide what is a value and what isn't. And we have some suggestions, some things to think about in terms of, of what you might wanna save and what you might not want to. Um, but uh, 
but it's good to be able to sort of recognize for one thing that you are the one that has the agency to make those decisions. So preliminary assessments, this is really just about going around and seeing what do you have and what do you want to keep. So in theater companies, this might mean that you have a whole bunch of different offices or you have maybe one office. Maybe there's boxes that are being stored up in an attic or in a basement or underneath the seats in the theater. Uh, maybe you have a, an external storage locker that nobody goes and visits very regularly. Um, sometimes there's also staff members, uh, depending on the size and scale of the organization. Uh, some of the records might be at home, at someone's home or in someone's garage. So really, the first step is just looking around and seeing what's there and where is it, what do you have. If you are an artist who is thinking about your own archives, this is also something that you might do uh, just to see what you have. Sometimes it's, uh, I think actually parents are some of the first archivists, so you might see what your family has collected, what you've collected, what do you have saved? Is it in closets? Is it in attics, garages? Do you have storage lockers? Um, where is this material? If you've worked, collaborated, for example, with a bunch of different companies over time, perhaps they have some of your material designs, uh, drafts of, of works that you've created, for example. So really being able to describe this and, and to write out actually, well, I've got 30 boxes over here. These are administrative records. We have production files in this room. Uh, we have uh, box office receipts and that kind of thing in the in the marketing office. We have um, a board member who has been clipping out every mention of our theater since we opened. You know, being able to have all of this in writing will give you a very clear understanding of where you're starting from. Once you have that that assessment done, you can begin to ask, uh, you know where are the gaps? What don't you have and what might you need to fill? Um, but you can take a peek at the kinds of records you might be finding. For example, a lot of people say, well, we don't really have an archive. We don't, we don't really do that. But once you start saying, well, do you have contracts? Do you keep, uh, do you keep grant applications? Do you keep um, administrative records? You know, they actually, you, you start to realize that, that there is quite a, a significant archive there. So in terms of uh, administrative records, these are some of the things that you might find. Uh, creative records, similarly. Um, design and technical records. And then there could be, you know, any department within a theater company will have, uh, will have its own set of records that they'll be creating and maintaining. Um, again, some of these uh, you'll want to keep and some of them uh, maybe you won't. Working with an archivist to do this preliminary assessment is really valuable because it will help you. They, they, are, they are people who do this for a living and they can tell you uh, fairly quickly, this is something you're gonna wanna keep. This is not something uh, really that's gonna be useful to you. This is something you're gonna wanna save for maybe about five years and then you can get rid of it. Um, but uh, that's we can help you with that. So uh, again, uh, reach out to us here at the American Theater Archive Project and we'd be happy to connect you with an archivist. Or you can go to, uh, if you Google the Society of American Archivists, there is uh, there are listings of, of archivists around the country who can do this work with you. Once you've done the assessment, uh, you can get a really clear picture of what the records you have are, uh, whether you're a theater company or an artist, uh, and where they are, what kind of condition they're in, uh, what the range of material is. And then from there, you can actually start creating what we call a retention schedule. So some things will have a, a specific lifespan and some things uh, you'll want to hold on to forever. So uh, here's some examples of uh, lifespan documents, uh, things like human resources files, credit card receipts, banking records, that kind of thing. Things that you may uh, want to say like, OK, we're going to hold on to this for one year, five years, 10 years. And there's oftentimes in some states, uh, especially as part of nonprofits, there are legal uh, requirements for you to keep some of this material for a certain period of time. And sometimes you're also obligated to destroy it after a certain period of time. You don't, for example, want to keep human resource uh, files within uh, accessible archives where, where potentially uh, other staff members or uh, donors or researchers might, might find it at some point down the road. Those are usually, that's privileged information. 
We have a, uh, this is a, a sample retention schedule. We have an example of this too in an online manual that I'll mention here in a little bit uh, that'll go into a bit more detail. So we've also got a sample retention schedule list in that manual. Um, you can also think about uh, really how you want to communicate this retention schedule and how, how are you collecting this material across different departments if you're a theater company. So uh, that means that uh, perhaps there's a staff member, a single staff member who is responsible for making sure that each of the different departments are submitting material each year or after each project uh, and making sure that that material is backed up and saved. You want to create a, a collection policy to make sure that uh, you're really being current with everything. And this is this is really sometimes people think about creating an archive as a one time thing and then you do it and you're done. But as long as you're continuing to create work as an artist or as long as your theater company is up and running, you will probably continue to grow this. And the, the better organized you are with your material at the beginning, the easier it will be to continue to add to it. But you want to make sure that this isn't just one person's project, uh, that they're solely responsible for, for creating this material, because if that person leaves, then the archive suddenly uh, becomes abandoned, and that's not helpful for anybody. So being able to connect the work of the archives to uh, maybe a specific staff position or a, um, a particular department will ensure that there's uh, somebody there who um, is making sure that it's maintained and properly cared for. So in terms of protecting your records, organizing them, if you've got them uh, in various different places, you might want to bring them all together into one room, uh, or at least into specific spaces that are that you can designate as archival spaces. The stuff that you might destroy later on that has a lifespan, you, you want to keep that physically separate from the archive. So there's no confusion, what is being saved in perpetuity and what are you uh, just keeping for the purposes of uh, business, uh, but will eventually be destroyed. So you want to physically keep those, those separate. If you don't have a whole lot of space, looking around to see what the most optimal space is really key. Archives tend to like uh, human conditions, so not too hot, not too cold, not too humid, not too dry. Uh, so somewhere around uh, you know, 68 degrees Fahrenheit at 50% relative humidity is what archives tend to really like. The closer you can get to that, to the better. Uh, the big thing is really wanting to make sure that, for example, you don't want to keep material in a basement that leaks or in an attic that leaks. Uh, you don't want to keep things under pipes. Um, I've known, I've gone into theaters before where uh, a whole bunch of material was kept under, um, under the seating in the theater itself where there were actually uh, water pipelines for sprinkler systems. And you know, even if it doesn't tend to leak, those pipes could burst at some point. And of course, once that happens, the material is damaged and very hard to recover. So you wanna think about what the best options are. If it's in filing cabinets, great. If you wanna move them into boxes, great. If you don't have a big budget, that's fine too. Uh, really, in turn, you don't need fancy archival boxes if you don't want to. You can get uh, record storage boxes from any office supply store. The big thing is just you want to make sure that they're not uh, highly acidic, and oftentimes they'll say that on the label, that they're uh, stay safe for document storage. And you want to make sure oftentimes the ones that fold, uh, fold together, that don't have a whole lot of glue in them, are better than the ones that have that are you know super glued together. The glue oftentimes can attract bugs, and um, sometimes the glue can transfer to, to documents, and you want to be careful about that. So um, really, you know, depending on your your own budget, whether you're an individual artist or a company, you can you. Don't fret about this. This is where people sometimes get hung up and they say, well, I need, you know, hundreds and hundreds of dollars, thousands of dollars maybe for boxes. No, you don't. You really don't. Um, you want to do the best you can with what you have. And when it comes to the actual work of organizing the collection, don't get overwhelmed by the size and scale of it either. Archival work is cumulative. 
So the bit that you do today is the bit that you don't have to do tomorrow. And really just getting started will put you in a better place than, than where you were yesterday. So, so don't, don't be intimidated by that. So um, if as you're going through the assessment and as you're going through organizing this material and trying to get it in some shape where you can access it, take, an, take a peek and make see if you notice anything that has mold damage, for example, or things that have a lot of bugs. If you've got costumes or props, making sure that they're not moth-eaten or that they're proper, properly ventilated, that's key. And that, uh, that will just make sure that if you've got a bunch of, you know, uh, soggy papers that are have a bunch of mold in it, you don't want to put it in a box with material that does, that's pristine, because then you'll be transferring the mold and the bugs and, and that kind of thing to the other material. Um, so identifying that kind of uh, damage as you're coming across it will help you in the long run. You'll also, uh, I think the time of COVID has helped us really think differently about emergency preparations and planning, especially for theater companies. The American Theater Archive Project website does have actually a section to, uh, to talk about emergency planning and operations for performing arts companies. So uh, you can take a look at that, but within that, you'll also wanna think about your archives. If for example, God forbid, uh, your building were destroyed by fire or flooding or tornadoes or anything like that, um, are there backups? Are there other material that you have? Uh, you know, Again, thinking about where you're storing this material in the space to ensure that, for example, um, if you know that your roof needs to be replaced, don't keep it anywhere that it's uh, potentially going to leak or, or uh, be damaged uh, by weather. A little bit about digital records. A lot of I know what folks are working with these days is, is what we call born digital. It doesn't have a physical counterpart. It only exists in a digital format. Digital material is really exciting. It's really important. It's oftentimes now where we see uh, really how a, an artist or a theater company, um, how, how they are progressing through their history. How, how are they shaping their work? How does their work change over time, institutionally or personally? And so uh, being able to save these records is really key. Some people will, uh, back up their hard drives onto external hard drives and that's really helpful and it's good to have that practice of backing up material it's good to know that those external hard drives really don't have a long shelf life sometimes uh, depending on the quality it can be anywhere from one year to five years to ten years at the most and so uh, sometimes it, all it takes is just bumping one of those external hard drives and the fan breaks or something cracks and it becomes very difficult to recover the material on it. A really good practice is developing uh, a sort of a mix between external hard drives and cloud storage. And uh, if you do have material that you back up onto external hard drives, every once in a while, just making a copy of that onto a cloud server. Cloud servers could be anything like Google Drive, Box.com, uh, Dropbox, any number of these different sites, Microsoft OneDrive. Um, so. These are, uh, these are really helpful, especially because the cloud drives you can share with multiple users. And if you've got a team of people working with you, um, you can all be submitting files to the same drive. That's really key and really important to making sure that things are kept current and that things are being preserved. If you think about theater companies being, for example, uh, historically uh, made up of freelancers and contract workers, after a production's over, oftentimes artists are already working on the next project or have been for some time. So as part of your work, you might think about creating moments within uh, maybe before tech or after tech rehearsals or sometime early on in a production's run of getting everybody together and making sure all of their back their, their documents are being backed up. So, uh, so also th same thing with emails. Um, if you, collectively as an institution or using something like Gmail, that's one thing. They're being stored presumably on a server, even if a staff member leaves. If you have access to the workplace and you're not deleting the account, uh, those emails are still there, but you still should be thinking about backing them up at some point. Um, and there's expl explanations for each of these, like uh, Gmail or Twitter or any of these services 
if you search their help section, you'll see information about how to download that material. If you don't back up your email accounts, though, you can uh, selectively print out uh, emails uh, that are really important or reports or documents that you know that you're going to want to keep for the archive. And that way you'll have a physical copy as well. So uh, yes, and when it comes to thinking about social media accounts and websites, you'll also want to consider those as part of your, your, your born digital collections, things that you might want to back up on a regular basis. Once you've, you've identified what you have and you've begun to sort of group it together and organize it and find a good place for it, uh, you can ask yourself how people will access it. Will it only be accessible to you? If you're a member of uh, a theater company, is it accessible to the staff? How do they access it? Are there people beyond the theater company um, that will be able to have access? Is there a point person? Is there a space that is comfortable where they have a desk and, and a computer maybe or, or internet connection where they can set up and, and go digging, perhaps a scanner or a photocopier? Um, you don't need all of that, but, uh, but you do want to make sure that you're thinking about access. The more that you can make the collection accessible, especially within your own theater company or to yourself even, the more you will be encouraged to maintain it and that you'll continue to add to it. You will, everybody will see it as a resource and not just as something that um, exists like a storage closet. So getting people involved in, in creating that access is key. You can also uh, leverage the material in your archives onto your website and in social media accounts. And I'll show you some examples of how theater companies are doing that here in a moment. But if you are ready to accommodate outside researchers, you'll want to think about policies and website rules. And so we can um, we can also help with this too. And you can take a peek around different archives, libraries. You can take a peek around different theaters who, who do make their collections open and accessible and see how they're doing it. Use it as a model. Talk with them. And we can also uh, bridge those communications if you'd like. If you'd like to connect with theater companies who make their collections accessible and want to talk to them about what, what's working and what doesn't, uh, we can absolutely do that. Um, so yes, also think about security and cleanliness too, so that people, um, if people are coming in, staff members even, or people from outside the theater company, if they're coming in to use the collections, you wanna make sure that they're not rearranging documents or taking things out or um, marking them up or damaging them in any way. So uh, making sure that everybody uh, understands policies and access is really key. So, uh, some examples, uh, ACT in Seattle, for example, will, has a section on their website, and a lot of theater companies have sections on their websites where they give backgrounds on their history. It could be as simple as, as uh, a brief description of, of the history of the company. Sometimes you'll have photographs of the building or different production photographs or costume designs, that sort of thing to, to illustrate it. And so you don't have the entire archive digitized. You don't have, uh, you don't have to make it all available online. And this is, this is uh, that's a lot of work to do. So sometimes it's, it's actually enough and really helpful just to be able to have background on the company. If you want, some theater companies do digitize a lot more material. And I'm thinking about companies like Roundabout or the City Company or um, um, La Mama uh, Experimental Theater Company in New York, where they've gotten grants and donations and funds uh, to really uh, present their archives in a digital format. And there's different ways of doing this, and perhaps that's that's maybe a topic for another webinar at some point, but there's uh, some really wonderful um, examples of how to be able to make this, this material available. So you can, you can scan material, uh, and um, it could be playbills, it could be posters, costume designs, uh, props, uh, really anything that you feel like will help people engage with your company, with your work, with your story. And then you want to plan for the future. Like I said, there's really, this is not a one-time thing that you do and then you leave it and then it's done. Um, it, assuming you're continuing to create work, assuming your theater company is still open, uh, you will continue to grow the collection and, and create new things. And you'll want to make sure that that's given the same level of attention as, as the earlier work. So anticipate growth. Figure out if you've, if you've got a space where this material is living within your building, 
think about how much material you might be adding to it each year and, and make sure that you have the space to be able to accommodate that. And again, I can't stress this enough, it's just making sure that there's a staff position or a department that's really responsible for this material. So that if there, uh, there, there is always going to be someone who knows what the archive is, where it is, how it's growing, and they're reaching out to the different departments to make sure that everybody's consistently adding to it. For any number of reasons, you might also consider partnering with an institutional repository, a place like uh, a local library or a university. Uh, where they can uh, they can really uh, process the collections and make it available. What happens then is that you as an artist or you as a theater company, you transfer the property, the physical property, all of the papers and documents, all of that material is transferred physically to uh, in another institution. And you no longer physically own generally that material. So, uh, you don't want to do this if you feel like you're going to physically want that material in the building or you're going to want to use it again. Uh, the institution will, will I'm sure, very, uh, and you can talk with the institution about this, but you, can, you will have access to it. That's the whole point of putting it in, into an institution. But you'll have access to it in some ways just like anyone else. You can get scans of material, but you probably won't be able to get original items back unless you've made agreements to that ahead of time. So really, it's up to you as an artist or as a theater company to think about uh, the long-term care of the archive and whether it makes sense to place it or to, to keep it yourself. And there's no right or wrong answer to that. It's really about um, what's best for your, your own circumstances. We're coming up towards the, the end, too, of, of this, this webinar. Uh, but I want to encourage you, again, if you, questions are coming up, for you. Uh, any questions at all, please do feel free to pop them into the Q&A or into the chat window. Uh, and I'd love to be able to, to hear from you and, and answer any questions you might have. As I mentioned at the beginning, the American Theatre Archive Project is here for you every step of the way. On our website, we have a free guide, uh, the Preserving Theatrical Legacy Manual, which outlines each of the steps we've talked about today and goes into even greater detail. This is completely free. It's a resource that's constantly being updated and the, the most recent uh, version is always available on our website. You'll see sample documents, including assessment guides, retention schedules, archival inventories, um, and there's a bunch of other materials on there too that, uh, that will help you throughout this process. In addition to that, we also have a consulting archivists program absolutely for free. You can email us at any time and we will connect you with a professional archivist who can help answer your questions. This is a really amazing thing that I think we're able to offer and it's really unique. Uh, other organizations have been able to offer this usually with a fee, um, but because of funding and support from donors and from the American Society for Theater Research, we've been able to, to do this currently uh, for free for any artist or theater company that needs it. Um, so we're happy to meet with you over Zoom. We can answer questions by email or phone. Uh, it's a great way to be able to connect if you've if you've hit a roadblock or you just need someone to talk to and, and an encouraging an encouraging voice to help push you through wherever you're at. Um, check out our website. It's uh, www.americantheaterarchiveproject.org. It's right here at the bottom of each of these slides. There's a lot more information on there too. You'll see that there's uh, there's a newsletter button here at the top. Uh, where you can uh, register and get information about future events and uh, monthly tips on, on your archives. How you can help us uh, is, if you can, uh, certainly spread the word, share the website, uh, join us on social media, uh, sign up for the newsletter, pass the word along, because I think there's a lot of theater companies that are working with their archives or thinking about it, or should be certainly thinking about it, um, but they don't necessarily know that we exist and that we are a resource to them. Theater, theater companies and artists usually don't think about their archives until it's either very late or um, there's some sort of major event, perhaps the retirement of a, of a longtime leader or um, uh, sometimes, unfortunately, when a the theater company is closing and there's a, a desire to, uh, to, to leave something behind, to be able to say something about the legacy of the company, and then it becomes a sort of frantic scramble. Don't wait for that. Uh, honestly, this is, there's never, there's never um, a better time to start than right now.
and every little bit that you do now will help you uh, down the road. Share your story. Uh, we are collecting stories from theater companies and from artists who are working on their archives. We'd love to know what you're finding. We'd love to know more about where, uh, what, what the process has been like for you, uh, what it looks like before and after. You can share your stories or photos of your work uh, uh, through our website, and we would love to feature them on the website and also in our, our monthly newsletter. We are completely uh, a nonprofit organization. Uh, all of our funding for our website, for our resources development, for, um, for our graduate administrator, all of this is funded by donors. Uh, and we greatly, greatly appreciate your support. You can find information about donating on our website under the support button, and we really do appreciate it. Thanks to the American Society for Theater Research, we uh, those donations can be uh, deducted from your taxes. And volunteering, if you are passionate, if you share our passion for, for preserving theater records and, and the legacy of theater history, we would love to invite you to join us as part of our board, our steering committee, um, if you have ideas of ways that we can connect with other artists and theaters, there are things that you would like to, to see or do yourself. We would love to, to get to know you and would love to invite you to, to participate. This work takes many hands and uh, the, the more the better. And uh, again, that's our email address and our website, and we do hope that you will reach out to us. And I know we've got a few questions, and please do feel free to, to pop in a few more if you, if you have them. Uh, so from Paul, uh, I'm particularly interested in archiving for theatrical productions at my university. Are you aware of any resource that provides any best practices for this? Honestly, the difference between uh, collecting for a university production program and for a theater company, they're really not terribly different. Uh, you might find that your department, for example, is collecting a lot more in terms of um, course schedules and syllabi and the sort of curriculum side of, of the teaching aspects of your university. Uh, but then you'll also have uh, this, the same things that you would be creating in, in a theater company. You'll probably have production bibles and prompt books from stage managers, rehearsal schedules. You'll have uh, you know season season publicity information, um, box office receipts and and ticket sales and that kind of thing. So there's there there's material there uh, to be able to preserve. But again, thinking about the turnover, if you have uh, you know changing directors and artists on a regular basis as, as one tends to have in, in theater departments across the country, you'll definitely want to um, make sure that you have a regular process for preserving this material, making sure that you bake it in either to the rehearsal or into the tech process so that um, there is a point where you say, okay, everybody, uh, if you haven't yet already, make sure that you're uploading your files, for example, to this um, Google Drive folder, or uh, make sure that you're sharing copies with perhaps the stage manager or, or this particular per point person to make sure that they're they're safe for posterity. So hopefully that answers your question, Paul. Thanks for that. Uh, another question, what are some ways to document information that may live within people who have worked at a theater for decades? Many theaters with long history tend to have staff members who are human archives in their own ways. It's a fantastic question. Thank you for asking that one. This is uh, this is absolutely what I meant when you when you've done your assessment, when you look around and you see what kinds of records that that have been saved, and sometimes those records have only been saved by chance and and by luck and just because somebody didn't throw them out. Um, so sometimes there's gaps if you're not intentionally collecting material and it just sort of happens to end up in an office, um, then you may find that you're missing some things. The best things to do is to, to really reach out to your community and see what folks might have. You'll be surprised actually to see, for example, that um, longtime audience members, for example, might be saving playbills or clippings or um, their tickets uh, to their production. So you can actually retroactively go back and build production histories based off of donations from, from longtime audience members or board members. Um, I really recommend, especially for those staff members uh, or artists who've really worked with you for a long time, uh, sit down with them, record an interview. It's so easy now with phones and with computers and Zoom uh, to really just set up a camera uh, or even just uh, an audio recording and ask them questions, ask them uh, about 
how they got involved in the first place, the early days of a theater company. If you're interviewing a, an artist, uh, you know, how did they get started? Where did they get trained? Uh, what kind of, uh, who, who's inspired their work? What's their process like? Uh, you can really begin to start documenting that kind of material in really important and interesting ways um, that you that are much more intentional, right? Than if you were just uh, saving the documents that are being created throughout the course of of your work. Um, so it's a great question, and it's really great to be uh, intentional about that and, and to think about who those folks are that you you're going to want to to speak with. We have a question too from Jarrell Henderson. I have an archive which focuses on Black theater vinyl albums, which I would love to share more widely, but I'm concerned about copyright responsibilities and limitations. Are you familiar with this challenge? That's a great question, too. So oftentimes with theater companies, the work is under copyright by multiple people. As an artist uh, who maybe, for example, if you're designing for a theater company, uh, you might have as part of your contract uh, who owns that work. Are, is it work for hire, for example? So do you, for example, as an artist, have the right to be able to uh, reproduce a costume design rendering, for example, that you created for a theater company? It's very likely that you do, uh, but you might, you might have something in your contract that says that that design is exclusively owned by the theater company. On the flip side too, the theater company might have material uh, in its collections that they don't own them, the copyright themselves, uh, and they would have to go and reach out to the artists. Uh, things like production recordings, you won't see them online very often because there's so many different copyright holders involved, designers, performers, uh, the playwrights, the, the musicians, uh, unions oftentimes will have uh, a stake in, in copyrights as well as the theater company itself. And so uh, copyright is something that definitely makes it a little bit harder to share things widely. And when you think about things like, yes, uh, vinyl albums uh, of Black theater, are, I'm, I'm curious if these are things like, uh, if these are musical recordings or sometimes like I know of vinyl albums like from the 50s and 60s when they were recording plays and the dialogue on those. Um, those are actually really hard sometimes to be able to make widely available online because they are under copyright. Usually the performers, usually um, the, the writer of any text that's being performed, uh, oftentimes the studio itself, uh, because the, um, you know, the record label who's creating it, they're, they're selling these, these albums uh, as a profit and anything that you do to um, make that less profitable for them uh, would mean that you're violating copyright. That doesn't mean that it's not important to save, and there will be a time when that material does go out under copyright. Uh, so please, please do uh, save that material, um, keep it under good conditions. You can still share it with people. You can you can find creative ways to be able to um, to uh, maybe. In, invite them over <laughs> physically uh, to, to listen to some of these recordings. Or if you want to be able to talk about them online, for example, um, sometimes you can certainly talk about the records and about why they're important. And you could do it for each individual album, for example, without necessarily being uh, able to share the actual recording itself. And that way people know that it exists, they keep an eye on it, you're, you're preserving the value and, and um, um, sharing sharing the information about the the document itself, if that makes sense. But thank you, thank you for collecting that work, and and thank you for for thinking about ways of making it accessible. Here's another question here: uh, What is the best way to archive full productions of a theater show digitally, especially a large catalog of shows? So yeah, I, so I would I would point you again to the American Theater Archive project manual, which will give you a sense of some of the different things that you'll 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 typically be creating within a particular production. Um, a lot of that stuff now is is really being produced and created in a digital format. If you're thinking about things beyond documents, like how do you how do you record? or try to preserve the sense of like how a new work, for example, was created through rehearsals and workshops, uh, you know, that's, that's oftentimes you, it's, it's helpful to think about archiving that kind of work as an extension of the artistic practice itself. 
it's not something that you're documenting necessarily after the fact, but you have to think creative ways of being able to, uh, to document it as it's happening. Maybe it's creating film recordings. Maybe it's uh, also interviewing people throughout the process. You know, what worked today? What didn't work? Uh, you know, what were you thinking when you created this particular scene? Um, or why did this moment get cut from the show? Um, do you think it would, you know, end up coming back at some point? You, you can you can use oral history interviews, for example, as a way of being able to document a rehearsal or workshop process. Um, I've been really interested in seeing how theater companies also work with uh, audiences right now. Audience audience reactions to productions are something that's very hard to capture. And it's something you rarely see in theater archives, but it's fascinating to see. So sometimes there might be surveys that go out by email now where uh, people will ask for feedback and those surveys might be saved as part of a production archive. Um, I've also been seeing theater companies like here in Austin, Texas, there's Fusebox Festival. Fusebox has been doing something really interesting lately where after a production, they will have like a photo booth set up outside the theater uh, where audience members can uh, go in and film brief reactions to the piece that they just saw. Or uh, they noticed, for example, this is uh, as part of a festival, they, they have multiple events happening at different locations around the city. And the only time that they had to really talk with the artists that they were involved with uh, was as they were driving from a venue to an event. And so they decided that they would create a, um, an interview series where uh, someone who was driving would be interviewing the artist in a car and they'd set up a camera on the dashboard and um, they would interview them as they're going from one place to another. And those interviews then become incredibly helpful, uh, you know, content for the website and for social media, but also uh, really valuable documents and recordings for the archive. So I think there's there's lots of different ways to think about that kind of documentation as uh, as an extension of the creative process and something definitely to think about um, ahead of time uh, to make sure that you're capturing it because the longer obviously uh, you wait after a piece is, is created, the harder it is to get materials uh, and, and people's memories uh, change afterwards. So um, I think, I think we've hit all the questions that have come in. Um, I really can't thank you all enough for taking the time to attend this webinar today, for all of your good questions, for all the work that I know that you're doing to think about and preserve uh, theater history. Please, please do know that the American Theater Archive Project is here for you and uh, will support you through this work. Reach out to us anytime uh, and we greatly, greatly appreciate it. Uh, looks like one, one more question. Uh, yes, could you make the PowerPoint slides available as well as the recording? Yes, I'll try to do that as well. Uh, so thanks for that. Uh, and you should see the recording probably go up in the next day or two. Um, and we will have that uh, available on our website. Do register for our newsletter. This is only the first of a number of conversations that hopefully we'll be having online soon. Uh, and we'll hope you will see you back again uh, at a later time. Thank you again for taking the time to join us today. And we'll see you soon. Bye-bye.